Two recordings on. Uh, this week we're really lucky to have uh, Jonathan Crane, who's going to tell us about uh, time series observations of exoplanets with JWST. Uh, so a lot of what I'm working with, uh, this is also applicable to brown dwarfs, but I particularly work on exoplanets. So it's easier for me to relate to that. Uh, particularly, one of the best things to no no notify is that there are four major science missions to the James Webb Space Telescope, the fourth of which is the discovery of the origins of life and the and planetary systems, which is where the exoplanet category comes in. I did not pop it up. I don't know what's happening. Okay, I'm going to cancel that. Hold on. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I'll start here. So basically, that the fourth option is where the exoplanet categorization comes into this. Um, back in 2015, there was a really great talk uh, series in the workshop here at uh, Space Telescope. One of the, the first times we came as a member of the James Webb community. And um, this is Enabling Trends in Exoplanet Science with James Webb. And it's, uh, there's a, all the talks are listed online. There's one from each team, there's one from each category. Um, people doing different research on time series observations, particularly the trends in exoplanets. And so a lot of the material I have is actually from this talk series. And then we're having another one coming up this July, uh, which is enabling transmission observations with James Webb, because we're now planning on putting forth planning uh, with APT and EPC for calibration uh, um, calculations on what kind of science we can get out of James Webb with all of our updated knowledge on the performance uh, of each of the instruments. So uh, July 10th, we're having a workshop here discussing, again, uh, what we can do with James Webb. So I'll be, this talk is sort of just recapping what we've covered uh, from two years ago, and also two papers that were published in the last year that I was working with. Uh, to start with, the reason we do time series observations is that the planets orbit their host stars, and if we can catch them as, they're, as they pass in front of or behind their host star, then we can begin to piece together the atmospheric spectrum. And so as the planet comes from on this frame from left to right, in front of the host star, uh, then we can get from that tiny little blue limb around the edge of the black ball, uh, the at that transmission spectrum, or what light is coming through. And you see in the bottom frame here, there's two different types of spectra we can work with. Um, the red ones from a clear atmosphere, the blue ones from a cloudy or dense atmosphere, they have similar geometry, they're similar uh, spectra. Um, and so what happens is, in this regard, you should know that up is more absorption. So in what happens is that the planet looks apparently larger because that blue annulus is a <coughs> If the blue angulus is clear, say at four, five microns or, or one and a half microns, well actually yeah, closer to 1.6 microns, then you, you the uh, that's that's the baseline for the atmosphere, and above it is where you get the uh, absorption features. On the top frame is the emission spectrum, and this is is uh, relative to the black body, but that it's the amount of photons coming off the planet, and if the planet passes behind its star then during that time period, you have no photons coming from the planet. And if uh, once it peaks out on both sides of the star uh, for its orbit, you get the differential observation uh, that gives you the emission of the number of photons from the planet itself. So all of our work for time series observations with trans and exoplanets is actually differential. So everything we do is star plus planet divided by star. Uh, and Here's what right now, some of the state-of-the-art work we have from HST. This is a water spectrum for a warm Neptune. Uh, it's called Hat 11B. It's one of my favorite plots. It's mine. It's a big paper. It's really fun. And this is actually incredible data. It's actually five sigma detection of water. And HST is providing, with WIPC 3 ir is providing a, a, a great ability to do transmission spectroscopy and emission spectroscopy. But we, can, we have a limited wavelength range and only a resolution, uh, spectrum resolution of about 130, which we then bin down to, say, 20. So we're working with very low resolution spectra and also um, to maximize the signals and noise. And so this is great in what we're working with, but you should, in comparison, uh, we've got about 10 times the avail availability of wavelength coverage and 10 times the availability of uh, signal to noise with James Webb. So we're expecting a, a great amount of new information and high quality high quality data. On the James Webb, of course, I think most people here know, but for the record, uh, there are four major science instruments. And that there's uh, three of them are the uh, near-infrared, near-spec, near-cam, near-ISC. 
and they cover similar wavelength ranges. They exceed under about 0.5, but most of the filter profiles we use cut off around one. And so you got nearest from one to three, nearest back from one to five, and near cam chunks it into two sections, one to two and a half and two and a half to five. And, and then the mirror reports from five to 28 microns, but for time series observations, you're primarily working with five to 10 or 12 microns, depending where you, you call the cutoff on the filter. Uh, cover each one of them and how, what kind of, what kind of observations you can do with them. But to, uh, for comparison to existing uh, platforms, uh, we have here on the left-hand side, Hubble and NearCam. They're very similar uh, technologies. Uh, the WIFC 3 ir is an H1RG Mercadian telluride detector with an ASIC sidecar. And the James Webb near infrared, um, all of them are H2RG Mercadian telluride detectors with an ASIC sidecar. So the technology is very similar, although 10 to 15 years newer See, 2005 to like, yeah, about, say about 10 years newer. Um, and the near cam in particular has a very similar sensitivity, so lower is more, uh, more sensitive uh, than Hubble, uh, but a longer wavelength coverage. And MIRI is very similar technology. It's a silicon arsenic detector uh, as to the IRAC and IRS, and then, but with a, a better signal to noise and of course spectroscopy. With IRS, we were only able to use that on a few exoplanets with MIRI LRS, we're expecting to use it on most exoplanets, or most hot exoplanets. Yes. The ASIC sidecar is on ACS, not on WC3. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, WC3's back end is what? Uh, WC3 is classical electronics. Oh, okay. My, my bad. bad. Thank you for the correction. Perfect. But ACS uh, has the ACS sidecar. Has the ACS sidecar from Helena. Okay. okay, okay, good. Okay. Um, I couldn't find a frame with all of the instruments on it, so here is comparison of near and near cam and near spec. Near spec is more sensitive, but has also longer wavelength coverage to near cam spectroscopically. Uh, and then we also, um, near spec also provides a prism. And then this line that I drew for the next frame, I, again, couldn't find them all in the same place, is the bottom of the figure here for near is. So the, the whole thing I'm trying to point out is that Near spec and near is have relatively similar within an order of magnitude uh, sensitivities. Near cam is a little uh, less sensitive, which also makes its saturation limits better. And then MIRI is its own uh, own system all off on the, the, the longer wavelength, which is excellent, actually, very good. You can do photometric observations as well, but most of our calibration is done with the spectroscopic. Uh, near is is the, uh, their opportunity for time series observation is called SOS, the single object slitless spectroscopy probably spectrometer. And in fact, what, they, what that provides is uh, three orders of the same spectrum. The, the second and third order go out to the shorter wavelength, but the primary mode is the first order, and it has from about uh, 1 to 2.8 microns. Now, uh, there is, unfortunately, spectroscopic overlap between the second and uh, first order, so our, our use case is, at the moment is about 1 to 2.4 micron coverage, but the team right now, this is just last week, uh, is still working on ways to calibrate out the second order to provide 1 to 2.8 micron observations for the first order. And we're, I think we're doing pretty good. I, I think we're getting down to available usage. The light will always be there. You can always use it. And if we get better calibration later on, we can do that too. Uh, but this is part of the things we're working on actively now is to separate the first and second order. The reason you see it's double peaked, uh, the top and bottom rows are the same flux. Um, so I, I call this uh, a saber because it's curved and thick. So if you call it a banana, you'll see soon why. Yeah, right here. You'll see soon it's got this curvature to it here, banana. Um, and uh, but back to the first frame, this is also called the, the Batman PSF, one of my favorite ones. Because it's actually two, it's defocused and then dispersed. And so you get these two long channels. And if you cut it into, into the uh, wavelengths, you, you end up getting two strong peaks with a curv curvature in the middle. So it looks like a Batman hat. I like that. Um, there is also a third order, but it's not, not considered scientifically viable. The light's there. It's possible to use, but it's not something you'd have to strongly saturate the entire first order to even bother using the third. But it's possible later on. Uh, as far as saturation goes, this is one of the uh, three, three major things that go into every TSO planning uh, is What's your signal to noise? Are you going to saturate the detector? And how much systematics are you going to have to work with? Systematics is something I'll cover later, but basically it's a limiting factor of our ability to extract the atmospheric spectrum. In this case, NIRIS actually gave um, really, NIRIS team uh, uh, simulated a bunch of different 
um, SOS observations at their short subarray, so it's the fastest observations they can do. And they were able to show that the first time saturation, whatever they qualify saturation, I believe is about 50% well depth, happens at the J of 5.7. So you can make a J of four observations and still just take the longer wavelengths um, part of the, the spectrum. And that's, if that's where your science base is, that's, that's totally viable. If you need the whole, need the whole spectrum, then you have to limit yourself to magnitude uh, uh, fainter than J of 5.7. Um, on to near spec. Near spec has, of course, the great um, multi object spectrometer with their uh, uh, micro shutter array, fabulous technology, but they also provide um, it what's called box, the bright object time series uh, observation mode. Uh, and I'm not sure it actually might be this guy here, but I think it's not. I think it's actually supposed to be over here. But nonetheless, what it provides is a 1.6 by 1.6 arc second slit, and that is the largest capable single single slit they can do to let as much of the bright object light through. What we've noticed from ground-based observations is that. Yes, please. No. No. Oh, okay. Oh. That was a fire alarm. Okay. What we've noticed is <laughs> what we've noticed from the ground is that the atmosphere will wiggle the uh, the spectrum around, and you end up getting slit loss if you use a normal uh, spectroscopic uh, um, small slit. And so we started widening the slit bigger and bigger and bigger. I've used outwards of 20 by 20 ar um, uh, arc seconds, and so the largest that they could do is 1.6 arc seconds. And they've done simulation testing to show that with the um, uh, predicted 7 milli arc second jitter, that this should be well within the, the needs for exoplanet observations. And so, but it's also on a dedicated part of the, of the detector, which is very useful for um, targets and target calibrations. Uh, to cover the opportunities for near spec, they actually provide a suite of, of gratings and a prism and a bunch of filters. And so what this is really useful for is the, uh, the time series observations can use uh, at the, the shorter wavelengths, can use uh, low, medium, and high resolution, which gives you different uh, duty cycles, different wavelength coverages, um, and different sensitivities. Most of our features are very wide, uh, like on the order of a half to a full micron. And so um, resolution is not a limiting factor, but having more resolution gives you more to play with, especially the longer wavelengths of the high resolution elements, you, you can uh, look at brighter targets, which allows you to um, uh, a lot of our a lot of our targets are even K of uh, three, four, and five, and so although you can't do that with the, these elements, it still helps. In particular, talk about their saturation limits. These are again one of the three major categories we, we care about, as well as signal to noise. Um, targets within the green region here will provide a signal to noise um, about 100 parts per million, which is excellent. It's uh, it's kind of the ballpark where we need to start getting into spectroscopic observations, but then they saturate around. So the, a good, good um, measurement can happen at around um, J of nine, J of seven, but then they saturate on J of four. So that gives you your range of quality measurements you can make. This is with the grading, a high, high resolution grading at the longer wavelength, three to five microns. Uh, and then for the prism, which was something we all, the exoplanet community thought would be a wonderful use, use case, it actually uh, has, a, has an extreme saturation limit for our considerations. It actually starts to saturate around nine and a half, uh, J mag of nine and a half. And so we're, again, we're working with things downwards of five. Uh, but there are still plenty of really interesting targets out there. Uh, some of the key names would be 12, JJ1214B and WASP43 can be observed by the prism. So you're going to, it's possible to get a one to five micron um, spectrum, especially if you can do the whole phase uh, opportunities um, you can get the spectrum over time, uh, for emission spectrum over time, which is a very valuable measurement uh, to get a two-dimensional characterization of the atmosphere and spectrum uh, depth and time for, for longitude. Hey, John, yes. is the dotted line the saturation limit? Uh, yeah, I put the dotted line there, but that's basically where the uh, saturation happens at some wavelength. Right. Yeah. Okay. And of course, if you want two and a half to five microns, you don't need to worry, like uh, with this particular plot, you can you can use the prism uh, for a J of eight object, it will just saturate below a certain wavelength coverage. Right. That's fine, it depends what your science case is. But I, I imagine from three to five especially that there are other better opportunities depending on your, your lim limiting factors. Um, one of the things I like to show here is this This is a plot from, I believe it's Solvin et al, 2015. 
where they went through, uh, they did a really robust statistical analysis on what we should be expecting from TESS. TESS is the trans Planet Sky Survey, I think. The SS, I get back. <laughs> but surveys, yeah, Sky Survey. And it's an all-sky survey, much like Kepler, which is expected to um, detect uh, a few, several more thousand exoplanets. In particular, it's targeting bright targets. And so we're going to get almost all of them will be spectroscopically viable targets, hopefully. Um, and we'll be hosting that data here, actually, so it's really important for Space Telescope. And the good thing is this gray bar here for saturation, that's the worst case scenario. That's saying that that's for the near-spec prism. That, that, that's saying is that the bulk majority of, in this case, super-Earths and Earths that we'll be detecting with, with tests can still be spectroscopically observed with all of the James Webb instruments. And, the, and most of them actually, most of the instruments are actually saturated between 5 to 7. And so, therefore, there's really almost nothing stopping us from observing it, the, the vast majority of exoplanets. I'll cover that even more later. So even though I've given these saturation concerns, it's not a population problem as much as it's a your favorite target problem. So my favorite target is not observable with the, with the prism. Uh, moving on to near CAM, and what they provide is they've actually 10 detectors. Uh, there's a short wavelength and a long wavelength arm, which, and, which cover the same field of view from module A to module B. The 10 detectors are eight in the short wavelengths and two in the long wavelengths. They also provide uh, two prisms, a row and a column prism. What that does is the row prism crosses all four amplifiers and can be read out four times faster, uh, but you also generate more data. And that's a, a, a new consideration that exoplanets never thought of before, is that we will be filling up the SSR on, on, the, on, on the observatory. Um, and so we have to validate not just the amount of time we're using, but the amount of space we're using. And so you can do a faster readout mode, which gives you better time resolution and, and definitely better um, uh, saturation considerations, but then you're filling up the detector and possibly the, the observatory would have to sit and wait for download. Um, the currently available filters and prism is in the long wavelength section of the of, uh, near cam uh, from two and a half to five microns, but it has to be chunked into two sections. One is the F322 double wide, this blue curve here, uh, provides two and a half to four micron observations, and then you have to go back for a second transit to get the four to five micron observations because the detector cannot the detector cannot hold more wavelengths. The actual from that blue curve there fills up close to 2,000 pixels. So you're using your entire array uh, just with the, the the blue filter profile. And so as a result, you if you want to get a spectrum right now from two and a half to five microns with near cam, you have to use uh, two transit observations, which of course is double the time, double the science cred necessary. Um, the F277W is a viable uh, observable spectrum as well, but the only use case for that right now is if you have spectroscopic Overlap, which is what we're also looking to right now these weeks. Um, if you've got, if, if you have a nearby star and you want to make sure your spectra don't contaminate each other, you use a narrower filter. Um, most of our targets we've looked at so far are fine. Most of the targets of all exoplanet observations are so bright that nearby targets are not necessarily a limiting case, although there are definitely possibilities. Uh, in the future, this is a uh, paper published last year by uh, Schlauen 2016 which talks about the viability of using uh, a short wavelength spectrometer on near cam called the dispersed Hartman sensor or DHS. And it provides a one to 2.2 or even one to 2.4 if you've got the, I believe the filter goes up about 2.3 microns, um, uh, spectroscopic coverage and that gives you water and methane in the short wavelengths. And then in the long wavelengths, you can get water, methane and CO2 all simultaneously in one transit. So starting and hopefully in cycle two, I'm not sure if it's going to push back, but our, our original projection was for cycle two, having this be viable. Currently, DHS is an engineering constraint for wavelength sensing. Um, but it's, it's incredibly viable. We've already done all the simulations side by side. In fact, uh, one of the best results is that a short wavelength spectroscopic observation removes degeneracies from long wavelength carbon species. And so you get this awesome constraint on the carbon, which is not yet, has not been conclusively done yet at all with exoplanets because you can rule out the water features by including the short wavelength observations. So it's a great combination. And lastly, and this is actually a, a beautiful instrument, but I don't have much of the, the data on it, um, uh, is the prism from MIRI. It's a low resolution spectrometer or LRS. The, the prism goes from, from the standard 0.6 to 15 microns, but the filter itself 
uh, goes from five to about 12 microns. And the 12 microns is downloads of two and a half, point uh, two five throughput. So um, depends on your signal to noise, depends on your, your science necessity, how far you're gonna go into the, into the red arm. But nonetheless, this is one of the greatest opportunities the exponent community has had for mid-infrared spectroscopy. Yes? Just so you realize the prism is actually the light blue. It's not the orange. Okay, I got that from a, a use, okay. And it's, it's not. Okay, um, and, then sure. the, and then the, the final, as you say, the final throughput is the purple. Purple, yes. Yeah. it's the, there's a, right, the slip mask. So, anyway. Good to know. I actually got that from a, like a CR to me. Okay, I'm glad to know that, yeah. I also I also put that on there. It's not it's not coinciding with the transmission itself. That's why I put the little note on the right. left. That's not correct at all. Yeah. Happy. No problem. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, so yeah, but basically, what you're still you're still going to get five to twelve microns functionality. Uh, very very good good throughput, and that that actually gives you not only carbon species, but you can also get ammonia species and and possibly even cloud species, which are rarefied um, uh, minerals, things like encetite and uh, other silicates, forsterite. Uh, magnesium, sil magnesium sulfide. These are these are things uh, uh, planetary people talk about as as grains of dust, and we actually have been noticing possible signatures of them in the cloud species capable of being in our exoplanets. And so, using Miri, there's a paper that was out last year, two years ago, that uh, talks about being able to spectroscopically detect them, which is a fabulous movement. But they have to be small grains, which is also plausible. Um, but so, in addition to uh, in addition to the uh, gas phase species, we can also get the cloud species observations as well. Um, now I want to move on to the kind of scientific yield that you get with time series observations. In particular, I mentioned this earlier, but the, uh, for the near-infrared, uh, um, I don't have this curve for Miri, but for the near-infrared observations, basically 95% of the population of known exoplanets and 95% of the population of predicted test, uh, test planets, which is the green, are, are capable of having spectroscopic observations with James Webb. The signal to noise will vary depending on lots of other parameters, but the detectors can look at the star and make a measurement. Uh, in particular, there's only about three targets which are not ob ob observable uh, by any detectors right now. You see top three. This blue one here is a known target and two samples from the test observations. And then these two blue targets here, pink 55, pink 3E, and the HD 219134, are so bright that uh, most of the near infrared observations won't be able to observe them at all. That's two out of thousands of possible targets from tests and hundreds of known targets from currently known targets. So that's pretty good. About three years ago, there was a, a meeting talking about James Webb with exoplanets, Canada exoplanets, and they came about saying that. We that the saturation limits are too strong that we won't be able to observe things, and that's so. I, the, these kind of plots we're still making to tell the community that James Webb can target all known but two transient exoplanets, just with different instruments. So with Miri, completely different constraint limit because that's outwards of the the the, the Riley genes uh, limits. So for the star, um, so this is the kind of data that we're used to getting. Uh, okay. This is the kind of data that we're used to getting and predicting. Uh, um, with the, the bars here are simulated from Greenwell 2016. Uh, with um, all, all of the flattish spectra, most of these are cloudy atmospheres or dense atmospheres. We, we characterize the, the density by the number amount of metals in the atmosphere other than hydrogen. So everything, hydrogen, helium, and abo uh, above those two uh, in the size. And so what they're, what they're showing is that if we get a clear atmosphere, James Webb, from 1 to 10 microns, has a, an amazing ability to observe uh, spectroscopic coverage. You've got uh, water, methane, CO2, possibly ammonia in the cooler targets. Um, and again, we can get the dust species as well in the long run. Uh, they didn't consider dust species here. But even that, that's in this clear case, which so far, I, I think maybe last week there was one truly clear atmosphere, but every time I gave this talk, I usually just say there's never been a truly clear atmosphere. The atmosphere is always denser than we expect it to be or covered with clouds, and we're just seeing the water of uh, the water in the Ripley 3 above the clouds. And so as a result, this cloudy solar uh, um, here, this flat with those spikes, flat here with these peaks here and here, that's what we're mostly going to be expecting from James Webb observations because the planet, that's what the planet's providing. Um, and then, of course, the high density observations here could be a poor constraint for almost any uh, spectrometer. That's because the, the planetary atmosphere uh, is opaque to the sensitivities we're able to, to achieve. 
Um, all of these uh, error bars that you, you can barely see because they're, they're uh, high resolution. This, this is high resolution to us, downwards of, a, of a R of 100. Right now we're downwards of R of 20. Um, so for the hot Jupiter case, the warm Neptune case, and the warm sub-Neptune case, it's like a super Earth. The uh, functionality for observations is, is, is very good. Um, when it comes to the cool super Earth case, we're still at the limiting construction of our sensitivity. We're not able to get signal to noise to achieve either uh, and molecular detections, basically. Is there a question? Yes, to ask how long are these simulated observations? Uh, these are one transit, so they're on the order of six to eight hours. Yeah. And, and so for a single super Earth, you're saying in one transit, you can't make what's pretty noise? Yes, yeah, and you might be able to bend down that noise, but uh, this paper in particular, and everybody I've talked to, say there is a po probably a noise floor of about 10 to 20 parts per million, and this was set at 30, I believe, so you could get a factor of two better. Uh, after even 10 transits, you could get a factor of two better. Uh, I know there's a, there's a quantum mechanical floor with KPC noise, but really it's the ability to extract the, the time series from the noise. And so there's uh, one of our is one of our primary con uh, constituents is also, uh, we're inducing something like persistence. And so that, that factor can be a problem, but um, it's, it's a signal to Systematic noise is our, is our biggest issue, which comes in multiple flavors. Um, and so, but, uh, but that can be beaten down with proper modeling or, or observational techniques, but current knowledge limits us to say, best case scenario, uh, 10 parts per million floor. And that's all, that's yeah. all single sample, just like your saturation limits? Uh, so there's one frame yeah. time per exposure? Uh, per no, in this case, two. it's, so it's single visit. Uh, yeah, so we, we characterize those uh, ability to constrain the atmosphere down to this signal to noise um, over time. So, so the single visit uh, characterization, that's what I keep talking right. about. Right, no, so I was asking about it. So you're, all your saturation limits you've employed, are they yes. for a CDS? Oh, they're for a single, single sample, single single sample, sample yeah. Okay. So off the ramp, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, here's for emission spectra. This is when the planet goes behind the star. And you, you're, you, see the, you see the photons from the planet itself, but we make a relative measurement where this curved line here represents the black body. Uh, um, if the planet and the star were perfect black bodies, you would get this straight, this, this smooth line. And any features deviating from that on the red curves is uh, spectroscopic detections. And so um, again, with the the cool, the cool planet, there's just not enough photons coming at you that your, your, your error bars are huge and you're not going to get a, a positive signal, signal to noise detection. But with almost everything else, especially with the mirror wavelengths, you're able to, the, the, the photon, the infrared photons from the planet uh, finally overcome the, the photons from the star and be able to make a positive relative measurement. When it comes to the hot Jupiter, we're already able to make positive measurements with lip c <coughs> and to make some beautifully clean measurements we're expecting with uh, James Webb across the whole spectrum. When it comes to the smaller targets, things get harder. The smaller targets give you less photons, and they're smaller, so they're less, less surface area as well. Uh, this is incredibly similar to the last plot, where the, the error bars are on the order of 30 parts per million, and there's a full spectral range coverage. Um, where, uh, with thermal emission, of course, MIRI is the dominant uh, case study. Now, what all that comes to, combines to, and once you get the spectrum, once you say, yes, there's, there's carbon uh, monoxide, there's carbon dioxide, there's H2O and, and maybe methane, you want to make a relative measurement of those measurements and say, uh, what is the intrinsic planet formation criterion that we can establish? And one of the ones that we've used previously is called C to O ratio, amount of carbon, amount of, amount of oxygen. You can compare that to the star itself, but those measurements are incredibly difficult to do. So we usually measure them to our sun, which is the C to O of 0.55. So this blue curve here um, is, uh, ignore the clear and cloudy names right now. The blue curve there is a solar C to O ratio, uh, what you would expect for the abundance of water at a variation of temperatures. And this gray bar here, you can see in the middle, is the best we've done so far with uh, HST WIPC3 IR, with just detecting the abundance of water. Um, and again, you can do these kind of plots for carbon species as well, but they, they've not made positive carbon detections yet. Um, now comparing with James Webb, again, this gray bar being the best we can do for HST, 
for water detection with a hot Jupiter and this top row is clear atmospheres and the bottom row is cloudy atmospheres for a hot Jupiter, a warm Neptune, a super Earth, and a, uh, a cool super Earth. And so the measurements we, we're predicting to get, these are all from that same paper, predicting to get are astounding, actually. The hot Jupiter clear atmosphere, which again has never been observed yet. We just never have a truly clear atmosphere. Those, those measurements are, are, are orders of magnitude better than anything we've ever gotten or expected to get before. But we are generally expecting, like I said before, this cloudy hot Jupiter. And those measurements are still pretty good. If I recall, the different colors are, and they, they went through a systematic uh, checking of how, how better you can get by adding different instruments. And so it's nearest near Cam and Miri uh, in combination. And so the red bar is, is uh, nearest by itself. The blue bar is nearest plus near Cam. And the black bar is nearest plus near Cam plus Miri. So that's just the experiment they ran. And so basically, the more, more spectroscopic coverage you get, the better the uh, error bars become, especially in, say, this warm Neptune case. Uh, sorry, sorry, warm sub Neptune case. You, you end up getting uh, a, a factor of two improvement by adding a new instrumentation. So, covering large wavelength coverage um, is one of the most grand benefits to James Webb, on top of, of course, the systematics and, and the availability of long time series. Uh, one of the major drawbacks to using HST, uh, although it's a beautiful system of, of uh, observatory, is that it passes behind the Earth. And so, we lose track of the spectrum every 45 minutes. And as a result, you just get less wavelength coverage, well, sorry, less phase coverage, and that affects, if you're doing time observations, that affects your whole, your whole uh, um, system, your, your, your whole measurement. Uh, in contrast, as I said before, this red curve here is for a high C to O uh, model. Previous, some Spitzer observations previously claimed you can get a high C to O ratio. And why this is important is it tells you if you're, it's hypothesized, and some, some papers have put out their reasons why, if your planet is at a higher, has more carbon than oxygen to its star, then you can show that the planet formation process in, uh, selected more carbon. Now that could be the location that it, that it started in. That's, there's some theory papers talking about the location of the protoplanetary disk. But it could also be the time scale under which the, the formation process occurred. So these have been used to, to claim that you can tell the location or, me or me method of planet formation, whether it be cold or hot star, we call it this is fast or slow planet formation processes. And being able to constrain these measurements with respect to their star is, is the necessary criterion. So that's why um, being able to distinguish between these two bars is important across the spectrum of a, a, a range of temperatures. Could the CO ratio of the star change with time and not with the planet? I don't know, actually. Yeah. Could be. Uh, if, it's, if it's chunking out more, yeah, for the CNO process, it's producing more carbon. I'm not sure what time scales that would be predictable. But the, yeah, I guess the planet could be uh, like um, freeze out the C to O ratio while the star is changing. I can imagine that. I never, never considered it, but yeah. yeah. Another metric we use for planet formation process is the uh, metallicity versus mass of the planet. And so the metallicity is how much not hydrogen, not helium is in the atmosphere relative to solar. And so we measure these things. Basically, it's the density of the atmosphere. It has to do with the size of the spectroscopic feature, assuming there's no clouds in the app. Uh, it's, it's a degeneracy of clouds. Uh, one of the best measurements we've made outside the solar system is here for WASP-43. And there's, there's necessary constraints there that the solar system observations were all done mostly with methane. And the WASP-43 was done, uh, measurement was done with Hydrogen, so I believe they have to assume a C to O ratio of 0.5 to make this uh, comparison, but still it shows the availability of doing these observations, doing these comparisons. And if all exoplanets fall on this dashed line, then we can say that exoplanets and our solar system form in the same methodology, the same time scale, the same uh, um, distribution of, of uh, materials available for photoplanetary dips. That's not probably the case, but it allows us to start from us and, and move out. I think already we have a planet called HAT26, which is a low metallicity object that's in the ice giant range, and so it's far off the line. So this is one measurement, and it's, it's, a, uh, it's always going to be a statistical distribution, but nonetheless, that starts us saying maybe things happen differently, maybe this atmosphere evolved differently. I didn't think about the stellar versus planetary time evolution before. It was pretty awesome. Um, so. The and also, all of these measurements are compared to our sun, not to their star. 
And so that could be, maybe the, the stars see their ratio, or sorry, metallicity at that time, I'm not sure the metallicity has changed. But nonetheless, um, comparing all these things is what matters to deciding, taking exoplanets, putting it in a, four, uh, a framework to establish how the solar system formed and how the exoplanet systems formed and all, all within the galaxy. Uh, lastly, we have here, um, this is the expectations for uh, what's called disequilibrium chemistry. And basically what we mean by that is things that are happening outside of thermodynamic equilibrium, where uh, material possibly from the, the uh, deep wells of, of, uh, of the planets are being convected upwards, or uh, material from the top of the atmosphere is being photoionized and dripping downwards. All of those constraints come in, can come into play. This green line uh, for a range of temperatures and a range of, this is the, um, how this equilibrium it is, you would expect. The green line is saying how, uh, the green line is saying um, equilibrium is happening. If, if it's off of that line, then we can start to establish maybe this planet is out of equilibrium, which is another constraint for, if you want to compare the metallicity and you want to compare the CDL ratio, you want to make sure you're making and assumption, your assumptions are correct. And this plot tells you how correct your assumptions may be. It's the most difficult one to make, uh, but they do show here error bars for how we could possibly establish that with James Webb observations. Yeah, James Webb observations give you long wavelength coverage, which gives you various depths in the atmosphere to work with, various molecules to, to detect. Um, and even the, even the band head uh, per, per se molecule comparison. And so what you're able to do here is if um, uh, if you get uncertainties like this, which is uh, predicted for, I believe, the warm Neptune or the hot Jupiter, that if the data point falls off the line, we can, we can claim there's a, pos a higher possibility that things other than formation are, are affected here. There's, there's both evolution from photoionization and also the convective upwelling of material. And so when you make your measurement, you say, I found a planet that's really dense. It could just be that it's denser than you expected because other processes are, are coming into play. And so you want to make sure to have a multiple dimensional parameter space before you start making claims about planet formation um, history. So that's the end of it. Yeah, that's the, that's the final slide I have there. Um, I was supposed to, I was wanted to talk about brown dwarfs and how the figures for them because I don't work on them. But, uh, but um, the idea is that with, with transiting exoplanets, we mostly can care about the planet and we get the signal for when it passes in front of or behind a star. <coughs> I mentioned that earlier. With brown dwarf, they're, they're staring at the actual brown dwarf itself, and they're watching uh, dust material or, or, or otherwise cloud material coming into and out of phase of the of, uh, of the of us, you know, our direction, and that changes the actual spectrum itself. They have almost the exact same fault limiting cases for uh, their signal to noise and their availability of, of detecting an object, but um, it's a direct measurement of the brown dwarf itself. While for us, we're, we're disentangling the uh, the um, uh, planet atmosphere from the stellar atmosphere. But otherwise, everything I said still applies. I still want to get across. That's where I finish. Slightly early. Yeah, okay. Good. Any, any other questions or plenty of time for questions? You were saying, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask you to uh, uh, expound a little bit on the, the types of, of, of observations, how long they are, how many okay. transits you have to get. Add sure. it together to get certain results and that kind of thing. Sure, yeah. So I'll go back to the, the paper is on back here. Um, this is with one transit. It takes from between six and eight hours just based on the orbit of the planet, how much time it spends in front of the star. Our primary constituents for uh, amount of time off the star is, is uh, ranges from like one and a half to three. With Spitzer Iraq, we had a lot of systematic uncertainties, so we needed to observe them for longer to get to, to disentangle the instrument from the target. Um, and, uh, but with James Webb, we actually are coming out with cleaner than expected systematics. It's pretty cool. And so we, we, these observations done with one uh, visit could take six hours. And then if you need to do two, three, and four observations, uh, say, to get better noise constraints on this cool Earth, you're, still, you're talking about 18 hours instead of, say, 24 to 30 with Spitzer. So that's already pretty awesome. Yes. But, uh, so I think in that particular case, you're talking mostly about um, primary transit and secondary eclipse observations. Yes. But um, I curves. imagine people will also okay. want to do phase curves, which will okay. also, Take which you might want to yeah. explain yeah, yeah, to people what, what yeah, yeah. that would look like. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so a phase curve can be the whole is the whole phase of the planet, and so uh, right now I think only one observation is being done for phase curves, 
and that's a WASP 43 because it's a, a 0.8 days orbit. So if you're doing a phase curve observation uh, and you're worried and you, you want to make it all in one go, then you need to observe it for a whole day, or one target for a whole day. And part of the problem there is that we, we started off with this with uh, James Webb is built into the 10,000 seconds uh, maximum integration time because of uh, the antenna has to realign. Um, we will be pushing through the 10,000 second um, limit, but the antenna will realign while we're observing. Uh, so we might get a spike in issue, spike in um, a, a time series because of that. We'll know where they are though. And then um, uh, there's also the data download constraints every 12 hours. So we can observe the same target for say 24 hours, but we have to stop observing, download, and go back. And so that could take uh, you know, two, two download phases. Um, and that's also for just the one day planets. We've observed the Spitzer uh, phase curves out to 22 days actually. Um, and that's for a super Earth because we needed to, we were looking for other planets in the system. And recently, you might have heard about the Trappers 1 system. Uh, the same PI on that is the, my, my original project. There's 22 days of observation with Spitzer, and they, they did it not to constrain the planet, but to find all the other, I think, seven now targets, which were confirmed by Kepler K2. Um, and so, yeah, so we, that kind of, that's a searching criterion. We're looking for other planets, but to characterize a single object right now, uh, most of the GTO, most of the geo observations are for transiting the emission uh, spectra, which are eight hours. And then if you want the whole phase, which gives you the evolution of the spectrum over time as the planetary phase comes in, uh, phase comes in the, in the view, uh, that could be two, three days. Yeah. Best case scenario we know about right now is I think six hours. And that's, that's a, you wouldn't observe that target really tiny, but that's the shortest period of time I know about, I think six hours. I think an important point to emphasize is that in order to achieve the entire spectral coverage of one to 12 microns, oh, right, you need a minimum right. of three visits because yeah. you have to use three different instruments. Yeah, as I was mentioning before, it's like times factor of three. And so if we've got six hours versus 12 <laughs> hours, depending on the systematics, yeah. Or even the orbit, actually. Some orbits are just that long, yeah. So, uh, and definitely we'll see for, to get a nearest near cam or near spec and near observation yeah to get a full coverage you would need three observations yeah anything else or is josh yeah i, I think i missed the trick in the middle you were saying that the, the trick then is just the solar value yes getting the value for the star was hard yes how why is it hard uh high resistance spectroscopy well no getting the c to o ratio because technically carbon oxygen species as far as i know not my not my forte but the paper i read on it just has very large error bars to get the error bars down to the constraints we need them to be. Uh, one paper I read on it said, was talking about the error bars being too large, basically. Now maybe you've got, you know, Gemini or Keck working on it, that might be different. Yeah. These are bright targets, yeah. so it means it's just like, yeah. we need signals in those at thousand or something? Could be, yeah. yeah. Maybe they, in general, this is in the request to 50,000 resolution. Yeah. So there are not many yeah. spectrographs in the signal to noise that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Just curious about, right, we have this whole, there's an ongoing conversation with this telescope about uh, Swamp 5, right. which is going to hit everything in the test's continuous viewable zone mm -hmm. at, a, you know, signals of noise of 100 or something, but only spectral resolution of, say, uh, 20,000, 30,000, something like that. that but in the, near, in the near IR, so I don't know where that plays in. Borderline yeah. geo. Yeah. yeah, I would love to see that experiment done. Yeah. It will be done. No, I mean, let's see the predictions for what they oh, get yeah, out yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, but right now, as far as I know, like I said, there's a, a one team I know working on that transiting exoplanet host stars, see the O ratio of the star, working with uh, several ten thousands of uh, resolution, mm -hmm. and they're just not getting the signals noise we need to make these planetary formation characterizations. I mean, also, that target I just showed you, um, that was, again, the best measurement we have of see the O for a single target. So that's uh, also the planetary observations also difficult to make the comparison. So, yeah. So that's the critical, like right now in terms of knowing things about the metal signal dose. Yes. That's C and O, C to O is the tool for. Uh, that's the metric that was kind of proposed back in 2010. It's still lingering in the field as a possible, because if you do, uh, there, there is case study for the location of the protoplanetary disk that it formed. It should have different C to O ratio, but that of course is our protoplanetary disk expectations. There's a lot of degeneracy there. The metallicity, uh, I believe, I feel, is a is a uh, better uh, cross stellar comparison. Sure. Yeah, and an easier metric for the star itself. Sure. Yeah. We also add nitrogen to the mix, but we just yeah. aren't sensitive to that right now. We're mm -hmm. really just using the three IR. Yeah. 
I guess I'm kind of curious as to what that command system oh. looks like with those. And those constraints I showed are also just with water abundance. If we can include carbon abundance of any species of carbon, then we can add a whole other dimension to differentiate. Mm -hmm. It would be very valuable. And of course, with Reedy of James Webb, it's the best thing you can think about for doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, oh my god. <laughs> I can think about a lot of things. <laughs> um, okay. Any more questions? Not that what? This is a crazy idea, but it sort of it keep, keeps coming to my mind. What about the non-transiting planets? Uh, the ones that you can see the phase curve for, right. but not the spectrum. Do you mean the high resolution? Okay, so there, so if not. There is one in transit. Maybe there are yeah. others that are not transiting uh, that are there. One way you see the transit is that the constraint of when it goes behind the star and you don't see the planet. That's the best constraint you can you can have for we can divide out the star. If you have a non-transiting planet, it has been done to look at the thermal phase curve that way, uh, because the star shouldn't vary on the planetary period uh, dramatically. Um, but, and so as a result, but spectroscopically, you'd be working with a lot of model-dependent degeneracies. Uh, say you've got a, um, uh, with the inclination as well, but the, there is a thing called high dispersion, high dispersion spectroscopy of exoplanets. They use a, uh, an infrared, the cryos or cryres, uh, R of 100,000, and they can watch the uh, Doppler effect of the star uh, move on the, or on the orbit of the planet, and that gives them a constraint for both, once you divide out the star, constraint on the molecules of the planet, but also the inclination. And so when you're working with a degeneracies from the planet, uh, non transiting planet, you've got the inclination effect for how much phase variation you should expect on, in addition to modeling the star and the planet themselves. Uh, it has been done, say, five times. Uh, and CryRes 2 should be coming online uh, soon. I think really soon, actually. Um, but uh, that's it. That's the only capability we have right now. Yeah. And so for non transiting targets with James Webb, uh, thermal phase curves are possibilities, but you're always going to be having degeneracy with the expectation of the star and the planet. Yeah. Once you block out the star, or block out the planet, you can say, I know the star cleanly. Yeah. Anything else? Um, if there's no other questions in the room, does anyone have any questions online? If you do, you can uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Okay, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Jonathan for his